Grace, it's a privilege to be with you all on Sunday nights as we study the Word of God together. Thank you for your faithfulness and your encouragement and just that you commit this time uh, to the Lord and that we can study together. Uh, so we are going to be getting into Romans chapter 13 tonight. Got your shepherd's crook. <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> may, may need it before it's over. We'll see. We'll see. So, um, we're going to start with uh, uh, the last verse of chapter 12 and, and then get into uh, the first verse of chapter 13. Uh, these are the words of God Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to assemble together, Lord, in Jesus' name, to study your word, Lord. And I pray the Holy Spirit would be powerful and active to apply it to our hearts, Lord. I pray that uh, our minds and our hearts be open, Lord, to what you would have us to learn. Uh, and to, I just pray, Lord, that you would receive all glory. Uh, I ask you to bless us in it. Name I pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, we are moving into the section of Paul's epistle to the Romans that deals with Christian uh, Christians relationship with government. Uh, now I'm going to be using uh, a structure and tonight we're laying a uh, foundation uh, but one of the best expositions of, of this chapter uh, that I've ever read uh, really um, is uh, comes from uh, a book I've mentioned it before, A Gospel for All Nations by Douglas Wilson. And uh, if, uh, if you're interested in that book, uh, you'd like to know how to, how to get it or where to get it, I'd be glad uh, to, to share that with you. Uh, just, just let me know after the service. Uh, but our goal is going to be to avoid misunderstanding or maybe even to correct some misunderstanding of what Paul has written in this <coughs> chapter. Uh, and some uh, serious misunderstandings have been rampant, uh, especially in our country, uh, but throughout the world over the last two years. Mm -hmm. The COVID uh, pandemic and uh, the Christian church just trying to figure out, well, how, how do we respond uh, to all of this? Uh, well, God did, did not leave any blank spots. Uh, he says the word of God uh, is for all uh, life and godliness. Uh, so all aspects of life are addressed here in the Word of God. And one of those places, especially as it deals with the civil government, is in Romans chapter 13. Now, <clears throat> uh, an interesting idea about the, the idea of civil government, uh, an illustration comes from a philosopher named Girard. So he tells uh, of an experiment where you have one, one boy, he's in a room all by himself, and this room is filled with identical toy trucks, okay? All these trucks, hundreds and hundreds of trucks in the room, they all look the same, except maybe they have a different serial number on each one, so the experimenter uh, could tell them apart if he wanted to. So this boy, he, he plays with some trucks, he picks up one truck, uh, and he plays with it, uh, in particular, and uh, they introduce another boy into the room, okay? Now, the room is full of these identical toy trucks, and the first little boy is playing with one. Which of those toy trucks do you think the second boy wants? <laughs> <laughs> we call that a society. <laughs> and if you're going to have any order in a society, you're going to have to have government. Okay? And it says that government, the powers that be, are ordained of God. So we're going to lay down uh, some basic principles with uh, scripture uh, behind it, and we'll go through these together. Uh, so the first principle is that civil government and rule is a blessing from God and not a necessary evil. Okay? There would have been hierarchy and structure uh, an ordering of society, even if the fall had not occurred, 
And because the fall did occur, we especially need uh, God's blessing of government. So in 2 Samuel 23, 3 through 4, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me, he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God, and he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. <clears throat> so when everybody uh, speaks of the government, if they say the name of the governor or the president, certainly our first thoughts is about tender grass, right? fresh springing up on the meadow. God says it ought to be, right? Um, so we are not anarchists as Christians. Uh, we are to be grateful to God for the blessings that come through civil government, okay? Next principle, God establishes a righteous throne with majesty, right? Um, if we were to meet a, a president uh, or a king, um, there would be something about that individual, something about uh, really their office and their position, okay? Uh, no matter how cynical we might be about government, and the reason is God made it that way. Uh, he establishes a righteous throne with majesty. Proverbs 16, 12, it is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness for the throne is established by righteousness. And the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly in the sight of all Israel and bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. First Chronicles 29, 25. And in Daniel chapter four, um, at the same time my reason, this is Nebuchadnezzar writing, at the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me. How did it get back to me? Who gave it back to him? God did, right? My counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom. An excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Right? Principle number three, the law of God is the soul of a good ruler. Right? Uh, from Exodus chapter 18. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them, to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So that comes from a section in Exodus where <clears throat> Moses is judging uh, for the entire nation of Israel, just one man, right? Every complaint, they bring it to him. He inquires of the Lord, one man for an entire nation. And his father-in-law says, this is not good. Right? You're going to wear yourself down, and that you're going to drag the people down with you. You need to delegate. So we learn about decentralized representative government. <coughs> we have a picture of the judiciary and why the metric system is a godly system, right? Thousands, <laughs> hundreds, fifties, and tens. So, um, principle number four. God requires true humility of his rulers. Amen. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Okay? They are to be humble before God. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was not. He says that he looked out at his kingdom and said, boy, what a great job I've done. Look at everything I made. And he ended up uh, eating grass and moving like a cow. Right? <laughs> That's the truth. Until he came, came back to his senses. So this idea that <clears throat> the law of God should be the rule and guide of every ruler 
I'm, I haven't looked at one, but I'm pretty sure uh, that the qualifications to get on the ballot don't include fear of God, tell the truth, and hate covetousness. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a wild guess and, and speculation. <laughs> All right, so that's what the government's supposed to be up to. Now it's our turn. Right? What does the Bible say that we should be doing? Our basic demeanor towards civil rulers should be one of honor. The Bible says, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. 1 Peter 2, 17. Now you notice the first sentence is honor all men. And that would naturally include the king uh, if it weren't for our wicked hearts. And then Peter has to say, oh yeah, that means the king too. Right? We must honor the king. And why do we honor all men? Well, the Bible tells us that too. It's because of the Imago Dei, right? Because of the image of God. Every human is made in the image of God. So to honor all men is really honoring God. Loving the brotherhood is fulfilling the law of God. Fear God because that is the beginning of wisdom. Right? And honor the king. So what the kings of the earth bring into the new Jerusalem is not a sham or a pretense. <coughs> Sorry. Revelation 21, 24. Um, this, is, this is presented in Matthew uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. That's the temptation of Christ, right? Where Satan takes him up to a high mountain shows Jesus all the kingdoms and their glory, right? Uh, there is something glorious about kingdoms, and there is something glorious in nations and kingdoms that would be a temptation to the creator of all things, right? Uh, that was not a hollow temptation. And that verse in, from Revelation 21, you see, they are all going to belong to Christ anyway. Right? Um, all power and authority has been given to him on heaven and earth. And so Christ knew uh, that they would, be belong, they would belong to him. They were promised to him. The Father would give it to the Son. Uh, but he wasn't going to do it Satan's way. He had a completely different plan in mind. Principle number six, tyrants love moral corruption and hate virtuous men. Right? Why do tyrants hate virtuous men? Well, it's hard to shackle them, for one thing. Right? At the show trial of Jesus, uh, they, were, they were accusing him of a capital offense. They needed two witnesses. No two witnesses could agree. Right? They couldn't find any in the entire city of Jerusalem. Okay? Um, and tyrants love moral corruption uh, because, well, as, as G.K. Chesterton put it, free love is the first and most obvious bribe to offer a slave. Uh, tyrants love public entertainments and private vices because they love enervated, dissipated, distracted people. Revelation 2.14 Jesus says, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication, right? <coughs> that was Balaam's uh, advice, his weapon of war. He could not curse the people of Israel, uh, but he gave them a way that uh, he could call, they could cause the kingdom of Israel to stumble, uh, and that uh, was through fornication, right? Uh, that word is the Greek porneia, um, which we have a very similar word, pornography, uh, which is therefore politics, right? It reveals our true political allegiances. Any type of harmony or concordance with the world 
is enmity with God, right? And you hear people talk about freedom and liberty. <coughs> and depending on who's talking about it, they may talk about it um, in one of two ways, right? In the founding of America, freedom and liberty, it was the freedom uh, to pursue virtue, to pursue righteousness, worship God as he wanted to be <coughs> worshipped, um, and be free from sin, right? Free from sin and pursue virtue. Those are the foundational ideas uh, of our Constitution, uh, of our form of government. And then there are people who talk about freedom, and they basically mean freedom to, right? Uh, freedom to do whatever you want to do uh, without any consequences, right? These are the freedoms of a slave. Freedoms that could be experienced in an eight by eight prison cell, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, free love, uh, free food, free health care, free entertainments, uh, free drugs, <coughs> right? They, these are the freedoms that some uh, push and they're focused on. Next principle. Absolute perfection in our rulers is not the point. Right? Absolute perfection in our rulers is not the point. David said in Psalm 51, cast me not away from thy presence <coughs> and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's what God had done to Saul. Right? Uh, Saul really blew it over and over again. Uh, God took the kingdom away from him. David, in repenting to God, after the incident with Bathsheba, says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Um, he, he knew that he had also blown it, uh, and that was the potential consequence, and yet David was a man after God's own heart. David had forfeited his throne, as Saul had, and he did know it, but God in his mercy allowed David to remain king. And it's said of a number of kings that they were good, like Asa, but that they did not remove the high places, 1 Kings 15, 14. So we do not and should not require absolute perfection from our leaders, right? Uh, perfection is the enemy of good enough. That's true in medicine. It's true in politics and in government, okay? We live in a fallen world, uh, and if a leader can get it, get it right most of the time, that's really good. <laughs> That's really impressive. <laughs> now, this one may sting just a little bit. Fair warning. Tyranny, tyranny is a judgment from God for the sins of the people. Okay? Amen. Um, if there are complaints about the government, then boy, it sure is a mess. This is where we should look first. That's right? right. Our own heart and the church. Because that's where they learned it. Amen. Right? <clears throat> you know, the Constitution is an incredible, it's an incredible document. It's an incredible blessing, right? It's been a blessing not just to our country, but the entire world. And, <clears throat> you know, over time, over um, our country's history, uh, in the courts, there's been this notion that, well, if you just interpret it this way, right? Yeah, the Constitution really doesn't say that, but there's a there's a penumbra, an aura, a spirit to the words that mean this, right? Where do you think they learned how to do that? <laughs> they learned that from Christians in church saying, well, yeah, that's the words, that's the black and white of the Bible, but... You know, there's a spirit there, and I'm sure God really didn't mean that, okay? Um, and that's well documented in our nation's history. As the churches go, so goes the nation. Amen. Right? So tyranny is a judgment from God for the sins of the people. Um, 1 Samuel 8, 11, he said, This will be the manner of the kings that shall reign over you. He will take, right? So in Deuteronomy 17, God told them, look, you're going to have a king, all right? But his, his main 
he needs to do just a few things, right? Um, really not do. Uh, don't force trade in Egypt. Uh, don't multiply uh, wives. And don't multiply treasure, silver and gold. Instead, he needs to write a hand copy of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And he needs to read that from the throne, okay? And in 1 Samuel, they said, no, no, we want a king like all these other pagan nations. <coughs> and God said, okay. <laughs> and uh, Samuel told them, that's what you're going to get, and he's going to take. Well, what's he going to take? He's going to take it all, right? He's going to take your stuff. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your sons. Uh, lo and behold, he's going to uh, take them to make all kind of stuff and treasures and jewelry and get horses and build chariots for the horses. It's going to be a mess. Okay? But we should remember that the God who sends tyrants to chastise us may also send uh, a deliverer to save us which he has done in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. And this idea is in the Old Testament too, right? Uh, the, the nation gets in a hot mess and God sends a deliverer. That's called the book of Judges. Right? It's just over and over and over again. Um, Ahab, right? Ahab was a tyrant. <laughs> but you know, even Ahab knew he had limits. Uh, he was pouting that he wanted Naboth's vineyard, but he couldn't just take it, right? It's like, boy, I, I sure wish that, you know, we could come up with, well, there's just, just no way, right? He, he was upset because he was king of Israel, and yet he couldn't have uh, Naboth's vineyards. Um, what Ahab did have, however, was a pagan Jezebel, right? Uh, he had her, and she came up with the idea of, well, how about land reform? Right? That might be a, maybe some rezoning laws. Um, eminent domain, right? Yeah, so, so we in pagan countries, uh, the king gets what he wants, and so uh, you could do that too, right? <clears throat> Next principle. Every manner of civil government is under the authority of God. Right? No matter uh, what the hot mess may be, it's still under the authority of God, Amen. right? <clears throat> and if God's not over the state, then the state is God. And God rules in his own name, and princes rule by derivation, right, from him. You see that in the Old Testament. The prophets were sent to the kings, and, and what did they say, right? Thus saith the Lord, right? The Lord was the authority, and it's time for you to listen up, O king. Civil rulers are the ordained lieutenants of God. Uh, here in Romans 13, the word for deacons is used multiple times. <coughs> the rulers are therefore appointed, delegated, and deputized servants. Right? They're deacons, they're servants, and servants must obey their master. Who's that? Us? No way. That's God. Right? Um, so the you know cartoon uh, of telling the police officer, well, I'm the taxpayer and I pay your salary, that is not a Christian move. Right? Um, not no way, not no how. Right? Next principle. Civil disobedience is required when matters of worship and the gospel are concerned. Okay? Daniel 3.18, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image that thou hast set up. Amen. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29. Right? So we saw this several times. Uh, I, I think of John MacArthur uh, and his church during the pandemic. Um, the powers that be said, you can't gather and worship the triune God. You can't do it. Uh, go home, play a YouTube video, uh, but you can't, you can't <coughs> worship the triune God. Uh, even though, you know, the, the counts are down, not a lot of cases, 
this, uh, this pandemic uh, wasn't all it was cracked up to be, not quite thought it was uh, going to be uh, what it turned out to be. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a serious illness, but we've dealt with serious illnesses before, uh, and we never told people, don't, don't go to church. Stop, mm -hmm. stop worshiping. Amen. Right? Um, and and that, that church, uh, that leadership, told the civil authorities, the powers that be, uh, God is the authority. Okay, and he told us to meet and worship, so guess what? We're going to meet and worship. Mm -hmm. um, there's another church in California. North Valley. Yep. <coughs> A lot of examples in California. Right? Uh, <laughs> no, no further comment. Um, so, so we can all agree that if the state um, says, you know, if it's a gospel issue, right, that's the buzzword, <coughs> we can really get a bee in our bonnet. We can say, okay, well, civil disobedience, that makes sense. We've got proof texts in Daniel and, and Acts. But here's another principle. <laughs> wait, wait, there's more. Uh, civil disobedience is lawful in other areas as well. Right? Mm -hmm. David, ah, David. <laughs> We're struggling, right? David honored Saul, 1 Samuel 24, 5, but did not turn himself in. 1 Samuel 24 and 22. Neither did Peter turn himself in, Acts 12, 11. <clears throat> right? uh, and, and in that divine, uh, divinely appointed jailbreak, okay, which, which is a wonderful scene, okay? Uh, Peter's there, he's in prison, um, and, and the angel, God sends an angel, and the angel has to wake Peter up, okay? And we think, oh, well, he must have been resting in the peace of the Lord. Well, uh, I think he was just taking a real good nap because that angel had to smack him uh, in his side. And then he has to tell him, get up and get dressed and get your shoes on, right? Um, so there, there's, a, there's a complete erosion of any kind of name it and claim it, right? The name it and claim it crowd had already been dressed and had their shoes on. But, uh, you may think, oh, well, maybe he just needed to get his coat. Nope, nope, keep reading. It says, uh, get dressed, get your sandals on, and then, then hurry up, put your cloak on, right? <laughs> hurry up, put your coat on. Um, so, so Peter didn't turn himself in, right? He, he gets sprung from jail, and, and he's, he walks past the, uh, the guards, and he didn't turn around and say, um, wasn't that impressive? God did that, right? No, he was he was a man on the run, right? He kept he kept moving. He went to John Mark's mama's house and kept on trucking. Uh, and he essentially leaves the Book of Acts a wanted man, right? So uh, he he pops up at the uh, Jerusalem Council, and then that's it for Peter, right? And this is the same Peter who writes First Peter two, right? Obey the authority, okay? Same same fellow. Uh, Paul, he didn't turn himself in either. 2 Corinthians 11, 32 to 33. All right? uh, and examples could be multiplied. So there's, there's civil disobedience and, and lawful uh, in other areas uh, as well. Uh, that, that really doesn't apply to taxes. Right? Uh, so around this time every year, I get a little itchy because I got to do and send in my, my taxes. <laughs> Um, but there is something um, I've, I've noticed and I've come to realize. Um, every year, I send a list, right, of blessings uh, to the federal government, right? <laughs> a list of these, of these organizations, right, of, of these ministries uh, that God's blessed our family with and we've been able to give to. And, and the federal government has to take that and say, that's real good, right? And and we're gonna we're gonna give you a, a break now. If you give for the tax break, uh, that's foolish because that's a very cold comfort, right? That's a, <laughs> that's that's no good at all. Amen. Uh, but I kind of I kind of do like the fact that the federal government has to acknowledge uh, God's work in, in that way. So, um, is God still sovereign? Yes, he's even sovereign at the IRS, right? And that is a, 
Uh, that that warms my heart. <laughs> it may not be it may not be an IRS agent that has to be confronted with that. It may just be the computer algorithm. I don't know, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I like that. Um, next principle: so civil government is covenantal and has a double covenantal nature, right? Civil government is about covenant and it's about uh, dual covenants. Okay. It involves God, the magistrate, and the people. Second Chronicles 23, 16. And Jehoiada made a covenant between him and between all the people and between the king that they should be the Lord's people. Right? Um, so in this country, okay, um, we're talking about God, the magistrate, and the people. So the two covenants. One is with God and the people. And remember... All, honor all men, honor the king. The king is with the people, right? <coughs> and the second covenant is between that ruler and the people, right? Now, we did not have a revolution in this country, right? That's not how our country was founded. We had a war for independence, okay? And we had a legitimate beef, right? Um, the founding fathers were not a bunch of uh, scoff laws. Uh, they knew their Bible. Uh, the The... Through the ages, those who have written about Protestant resistance uh, to government, they, they knew their Bible, and they've known that very, very well. Um, the beef was the king broke faith first, right? It was the king's job uh, to make to pass the rules. Uh, and instead, he abdicated that, and he let a parliament in London make rules. Uh, when we had our own uh, parliament and government here, and he said, well, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. So King George broke faith first, and we violated that covenant. Um, so we got we got several more to go through, um, but let's um, let's end with this one. No human authority, civil magistrates included, can be absolute. Okay, Amen. God alone has absolute authority. A man's authority is always limited and bounded. So we have, we have three spheres of government, right? We have the home, the church, and then the civil government, right? Three spheres. And in those three spheres, no one individual has absolute authority. Not the husband, not the father, not the pastor, not the mayor, not the president, not the king, not the emperor, right? They are all bounded. Um, in this country, what is the authority bounded by? Well, a constitution, right? That's that's what sets the limits on either side, and the rulers have to stick with that. They've got to stay within those bounds. And so, this is what Nebuchadnezzar actually confessed after his sanity returned in Daniel four thirty five, which we've written. Okay, and and why does well why do we have to set those boundaries in things like constitution? Well, it's because of original sin, right? If you were to give one human being absolute authority, what would that look like? We don't know in every case, but we can figure it'd be pretty bad, right? <laughs> um, so uh, the, the authority doesn't get to write their own job description, okay? God writes the ruler's job description. Because if you let the ruler do it, what's it going to be? How about this? I'll take care of you, and you just do whatever I say. Is that a deal? Does that sound good? Um, so no, we have things like constitutions, and we have to hold the rulers to them. Uh, so let's stop there.